Hi guys, and welcome back to History of Vision Success. So we are looking at the A-level um, Weimar and Nazi Germany topic, and we are on our last video in the um, theme of was there a Nazi terror state? Now, previously I've gone through the methods and I've also gone through a more um, depth video on resistance. Now I wanted to do this as separate because there's quite a lot to say about the church in terms of the resistance that they posed towards the creation of this terror state. Um, and that's really what this video is going to be focused on. So one of the main groups that posed opposition and resistance to the Nazis was the church. And this comes into the wider topic of religion in Nazi Germany, which we'll look at um, later, basically. In the context of this, I want to know how far resistance by the church prevented the formation of Hitler's terror state. Um, and really, what I think we can do is sum up this relationship between Nazi the Nazi party and the church in three quotations. Now, Christianity is the unshakable foundation of the moral life of our people, Hitler said in 1933. Hitler Youth then went on to say that no evil priest can prevent us from feeling that we are the children of Hitler. Um, that was a song in 1934. And then we have the very kind of opposite to what he previously said, um, you are either a Christian or a German you can't be both by Hitler in 1933. Now, I think we can use these three quotations to really characterize the three parts and the, the procedure that takes place between the church and the, the party. We have control in the first instance, then we have trying to influence, and then finally we have trying to replace entirely. So it's definitely a very tense relationship between Hitler and the church. Um, the reason they prevent such a threat to him is that they're really the only organization that retain an alternative ideology independent of the regime. They also have autonomy and an organization that long preceded the Nazi party. This meant the influence of priests and pastors was at least as strong as the Nazi party itself. The churches also knew that in an outright conflict with the state, they would likely lose. So this put them in a position where they're prepared to compromise. And in the beginning, we see the churches compromising. And then that's where we see Hitler starting to try and control and influence them. So we see a limit to that compromise arise. And there comes a point in both the Catholic and the Protestant church where they're not prepared to, to go along with this anymore. And I think that's what we really want to know. We really want to know how far, when, when that point is, when they reach it and how far it is a threat to Hitler's regime when they do, what are the churches able to do? What are they able to create in terms of opposition to the regime that really no other organization had the power to? Now, um, it's important to note that resistance from the church is varied over time um, and even from pastor to pastor. So not everyone is the same and not everyone accepts the same things and not everyone cares about the same things. Not everyone acts in the same way. So there really is a very individual basis to this element of resistance. Now, just for your context, at the time, um, I'm just going to go through kind of some figures about how popular both these churches were at the time. So you kind of know the context. So first of all, the Catholic Church. Now, they had 22 million members, which was around 32 percent of the population, which was concentrated in the west and the south of Germany. Their youth organizations had 1.5 million members. And this was something which was protected originally in the Concordat, which I'll get to later. And then that Hitler starts to, to try to take over and take control of, which is something which the Catholic Church aren't really prepared to allow. Now, they also have um, some very strong political parties and the Z and the BVP parties together regularly received around one fifth of the votes in Weimar elections. The Protestant Church, on the other hand, had around 40 million people, 58% of the population. So it was by far the dominant religion in Germany. It was traditionally kind of nationalist and had supportive conservative parties during the Weimar Republic. So the idea of being nationalist, the idea of Protestant kind of came together simultaneously. Now, they were more divided than the Catholic churches with Lutheran elements and Calvinist elements. And they were kind of organized into 28 state based churches. So more divided. Youth organizations had 0.7 million members, so a bit less than the Catholic Church. 
Now, I'm going to start by talking through the Protestant church and what happened with the Protestant church. So Nazi efforts to coordinate the Protestant church into the Volksgemeinschaft led to division within the Protestant congregation. The Nazis created a unified Reich church, an umbrella organization of the Protestant churches set up as a means of coordinating religion. So kind of imagine at the top, this umbrella being the Reich church and everyone should be a member of the Reich church and therefore in Hitler's mind controlled by them, exactly what they did with other elements of the regime um, in terms of the law lawyers. Remember they created their own body to umbrella all the lawyers. They create their own umbrella to embody all the artists, all the um, people who are involved in art, architecture, music, etc. cetera. Um, however, the creation of the Reich Church led to the formation of the Pastor Emergency League in 1933 and the Confessional Church in 1934. These were acts of resistance against that Reich Church and that idea of conformity, okay? So these were both groups that presented resistance to the regime and resistance to Hitler, created outside of Hitler's ideas and outside of his, um, his desire, essentially. They are opposition groups. Now, the confessional church attracted around 5,000 members of clergy. This shows Protestant churchmen are trying to protect the independence of the church. They are resisting the attempt to impose the Aryan paragraph, which was the 1933 law on reconstruction of the professional civil service, which meant in reality for churches that those who were not of Aryan birth had to be dismissed from their jobs, which was applied to pastors who had converted from Judaism to Protestantism. So they're unhappy about that. They don't believe or agree with it. Um, and it defends a Lutheran theology based only on the Bible and not part of the Nazis, you know, not also based on the ideas of the Nazi state. Now the confessional church um, posed a threat to the Nazi regime in 1934. They spoke out against the Nazified Christ from their pulpits. They refused to fly the swastika and as they were supposed to, and the normal Nazi methods of violence and intimidation were less effective against clergymen. When two confessional church bishops were arrested, there were mass demonstrations. Remember, the church controls, you know, the minds of so many people in a way that other organizations were never able to capitalize on. So if the if people are unhappy with something done to churchmen that's an entirely different level of resistance than how you how you know you might feel if you are unhappy about the treatment of of two two people in society who have been mistreated clergymen hold an entirely different role in society and in people's minds and you know the catholic church in particular which i'll get to later has an entire organization beyond germany itself so it's an incredibly threatening regime or a, sorry, an incredibly threatening element of society to be opposed to you. So the regime responded with increased repression as we always see, and dissenting pastors had their salaries stopped, they were banned from teaching in schools, and they were sometimes arrested. So again, we're seeing that control over career, that control over the ability to do what you want to do um, if, you, if you threaten the way of or the status quo. By the end of 1937, over 700 had been arrested and imprisoned. Now, one individual you should know of is a man called Martin Niemüller. Now, he's a Protestant pastor who had previously been a U-boat commander during the First World War. He was a strong nationalist, and despite having initially welcomed Hitler, he started to oppose Nazi efforts to politicize the church. He was a co-founder of the confessional church and was sent to a concentration camp in 1937. He was treated as a special prisoner and was given certain privileges. However, he was still viewed as a martyr for the church. He repudiated all anti-Semitic comments and beliefs he had held after his time in the camp. So before going into the camps, he was actually known to have had some anti-Semitic beliefs himself. After his experience there, obviously he was probably alongside, you know, lots of Jewish prisoners and he saw the treatment of them. Um, he repudiated, which means rejected, all of those beliefs and ideas he had he had once had. Now, he made a very, very famous um, statement in 1946, which I think is very resonant of the idea of why people did not resist this terror state. He said, they first came for the communists and I didn't speak up because I wasn't a communist. Then they came for the trade unionists and I didn't speak up because I wasn't a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews 
And I did not speak up because I wasn't a Jew. And then they came for me. And by that time, there was no one left to speak up. I think it resonates the idea that, you know, if you fit into the mold, if you fit into the community, you'll just be left alone. And that to speak out at any point means you're going to be sucked into this terror system established by the fear and repression of the police system. So I think it's really, really interesting way of kind of summing up and summarizing the effectiveness of the police system and the terror state in Nazi Germany. So in a conclusion to kind of the Protestant resistance then, while the Nazis failed to silence the confessional church, the majority of its members professed their loyalty to Hitler. It fell on individual pastors who risked their lives and liberty to speak out rather than a movement from the church as a whole. Now, in terms of the Catholic church, so the Catholics were in a stronger position to retain independence than the Protestant church as the Catholic church was already more united and centralized as well as having independence from the state and owing allegiance elsewhere, obviously to the Vatican in Rome. Now leadership still tried to come to an agreement and sign the Concordat in 1933, I'll go over this in more detail in the video about religion. This gave the Catholic Church privileges. However, the Nazis started to break these agreements almost immediately, such as interfering with Catholic schools and youth groups. The Nazis sterilization law um, was also seen as highly offensive by the church, along with the T4 euthanasia program, which was a program where they were um, euthanizing you know, children and members of society who had any kind of um, mental or, or quite severely physical disability. The Nazis, um, sorry, it was clear that the Catholic Church was under attack. And in 1937, Pope Pius XI issued With Burning Grief that condemned Nazi hatred of the church. This was smuggled into Germany and it was secretly printed and distributed by foot. It was then read from every Catholic church pulpit in Germany in March, 1937. This was the only moment of outright opposition from the church and it was met with an increase in repression. Charges became common against abuses from the pulpit. Um, however, the Nazi violence and intimidation worked in exactly the same way as it had done with the Protestant church. There was even a dedicated clergy barracks at Dachau concentration camp filled with clergy members who had been imprisoned because they were speaking out. Therefore, again, as with Protestants, it was left to brave individuals to oppose Nazi policies on their own. Now, one key um, man within this kind of idea of resistance or one key resistor was Clemens von Gallen, the Archbishop of Münster. In 1935, he issued a pamphlet refuting Rosenberg's atheist views, who was a leading Nazi ideologist, particularly criticizing his race, racial soul. So the kind of the idea of the racist rhetoric from within the Nazi party ideology. 19,000 people turned out to support him in the July procession, double the number that normally showed, showing how much support he would garner if he chose to. Now this meant, and this told Hitler, that he was too important to arrest. So it shows somebody who is outside of Hitler's remit of control. Now, Gallen is also very vocal um, in, the T, in speaking out against the T4 programme. And this is one thing that, the, that Hitler stops. He stops the T4 programme. He doesn't come out and say, I've stopped it because of the church. He doesn't come out and say, I've stopped it because of Gallen. But we can use it as evidence that Hitler does not have total control over Germany. However, of course, this is one policy, the T4 programme, the euthanasia programme within Germany. And I guess it's something which is probably one of the most, alongside obviously the, the treatment of, of Jews and, and other groups within Germany, one of the most difficult to accept. It also, I guess, kind of defeats the idea of the community because Hitler creates this community, this internal community, and he places certain people outside of that community. And it's one thing to have, you know, groups like the Jew, the Jews, um, Roman Gypsies, all of all of those different groups, the Roman people, sorry, um, outside of the community and say, we're going to treat these people in this way, but then we're going to take people from within the community, from within your families, within your units, 
and we're going to get going to get rid of them as well and i guess that the t4 program was something which maybe hitler accepted was a bit too difficult to enact um, at this point however it's still a success for gallen now the church did not go beyond defending its own independence to be honest and they did not pose um much wider opposition towards the nazis or their other policies they they really only protected themselves outside of this movement from gallen on an individual basis about speaking out against t4 therefore as a whole you know we can say that that church resistance was quite ineffective however the fact it exists is one of the most prominent examples of there being some form of resistance to the terror state. So what I suggest you do at this point is you go back to that first original video I filmed on the approach to the question and you re-watch my conclusion for the whole topic. Now that we have all of the parts in play, you have your evaluation with resistance and church resistance, you have your methods with the police, with the law and with the propaganda and the Hitler myth, and you now need to go away and think about how you can summarize and bring this into some conclusion points.